I try to get feedback from as many people as possible. Um, and um, so I have, I have like friends and I ask them to, you know, what they think of this, that, that and the other thing. And, um, you know, uh, as mentioned, you know, Larry's a good, Larry Page is a good friend of mine, value his advice a lot. Um, and um, I have many other good friends. And uh, so, so I think it's good to solicit feedback, uh, and particularly negative feedback, actually, because, you know, obviously people aren't, don't love the idea of giving you negative feedback, um, unless, unless it, it's like some, you know, on, on, on uh, blogs, they, they do that. Tell me why I suck. My favorite question to ask somebody who I respect and I want to learn from is please tell me why I suck. <laughs> it might seem a little crazy. It might seem a little out there, but here's why I do it. Feedback is so important for you to grow your business. You don't know <laughs> anywhere close to everything you need to know to get to where you want to be. And you're going to get a lot of negative feedback. You get a lot of criticism. You get a lot of people who might be in your family or friend circle or people you went to school with who tell you their advice, right? Lots of people give you unsolicited advice. That's not necessarily that helpful, right? Telling me that I suck is not the actual answer for, for people around you. But when it's somebody that you respect who actually has information to give you, what happens is people are afraid of hurting your feelings. So the somebody who you look up to, who might be able to give you the information, they would be afraid just because it's, it's normal human nature. Most people will not be direct, honest, blunt, tell you the, the, the hard facts and the truth, the whole truth, because they're afraid of hurting your feelings, right? But when you lead with, tell me why I suck, here's what happens. They might have three ideas for you. If you just ask for feedback, they're gonna share their one idea. That's the safest, that's the simplest, that's the easiest, that's the least likely to hurt your feelings. If you lead with tell me why I suck, they tell me why it's like the worst thing you've ever seen. What they're gonna do is say, well, it doesn't suck, right? Like, hey, you should be proud of yourself and what you made, but here's the three things I would do to fix it. You get a lot more truth, you get a lot more honesty because you led with tell me why I suck. I remember doing a keynote um, at a YouTube event and I, I shared this strategy and, and that was the main theme for the ending and they, they filmed it and the MC came up and said, what did you learn from Evan today? And they all said, we suck. <laughs> Which as a standalone doesn't really fit the belief vibe of what I'm usually going for. But it was funny and, and they got the message across because when I'm at an event like that with YouTube, there are a handful of people that I would listen to for advice, right? As you get higher and higher and better and better at something, you don't listen to everybody's opinion anymore. Now, if it's something like who I should profile next or some themes or content, definitely open. For its specific strategies on YouTube, you're gonna start looking at people who have actually done it, right? As you get better at something, there's fewer people who can teach you. So there's a handful of people who I like to collaborate with and seek their feedback and counsel. And that's what I'll always say. Every time I'm at one of those events, I'll find those people, like five people I can count on my hand. I would go, hey man, tell me why I suck. Like, do you mind spending eight minutes looking at my channel again and just tell me why it sucks and it's like the worst thing you've ever seen? And I'll say it exactly like that. And again, the response is always, well, dude, like, come on, you don't suck. You have 3 million subscribers, it's great. But you know what, here's what I would do. Two, three. You're giving permission to people to be honest. You recognize that it's out of love. Some people will give you a lot of negative comments, not out of love, <laughs> right? They'll tell you that you suck and all the things that are wrong and who are you to do something like this and what makes you think that you're good enough to do this? You don't have the education and family and connections and resources and money and smarts and you're too ugly too. <laughs> <laughs> right? All of these things that people throw at us, but they haven't done the thing that we've, we're trying to do, right? If somebody hasn't done the thing that you want to do, their advice is not very meaningful. If anything, you should probably do the opposite because they don't know what they're talking about. And yet we listen to these people, right? We, we often listen to the people who are closest to us because they're in our proximity. But if they haven't done the thing, you know, just because you went to high school with them doesn't mean that their opinion means something. 
on the thing that you're trying to do. Chances are they took their shot at one point and they didn't hit it and now other people around them can't have success either. It happens a lot of the times. So the advice is meaningless. But when you find the person and you seek out people who have done the thing that you want to do, you have to give them permission to be 100% honest with you. Now, you might be asking, well, I don't know anybody. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't nobody, nobody wants to talk to me. Nobody in a, who's done the thing at a high level, I can't pick them up and, and send them a, a text message or call them on the phone. Great. This is where intentional learning really makes a difference. I can't tell you the number of events that I've done, uh, whether it's virtual or in person, where there's always Q&A at some point. So if you're going to an event where you're signing up for, for a Zoom call and the person who you want to learn from is on that call, what most people do is they become passive listeners. You're passively taking out your notepad and you're taking notes. You got your phone and you're like taking notes on it and like, oh, that's a good insight. That's a good insight. But it's passive because you are not going in to the event with an outcome. Your goal should be if you want to make learning active, if you want to actually get the most from the experience and be able to make the contacts and get your questions answered, you have to know what the question is going to be that you're going to ask, right? So here's what you should do. First off, whoever your heroes, mentors, guides are, you want to follow them on all the platforms where they can go live. I Just before this, I was live on Instagram and we had a whole bunch of people asking questions. Follow, if you want to talk to me, follow me on Instagram. Join my Discord, evancarmichael.biz. Get in there. We're having great conversations. But the people who are your heroes, follow them on the platforms where they might go live. Look at where they might be speaking at an upcoming event. And then when you go and attend that event, have a plan for your learning so that it's not just passively going through the exercise and activities that they gave you. That's all a bonus. If you're going to go to some conference and there's an activity sheet or, or workbook to go through, great. That's all a bonus. You need to know going in. What do I want to learn? If I got a chance to ask this person one question, what would that question be? What's the outcome that I want from this? Most people don't do that. And you get caught up in the hype and the energy and the motivation of, ah, oh, so amazing, woo. But then you still didn't get the answer that you could have had if you're just more intentional. So you show up and then when they do the questions, like, okay, we're going to Q and A, boom, you're the first one there. You're the first one there. You're not, you're not, you might be nervous. Your heart, your heart might be pounding out of your chest like crazy, but you're the first one there. You're standing by the microphone. You're ready to go. You got your hand up before they even go to Q and A and the zoom chat, right? Like you are ready to go with your question. The one that you want an answer to. And then you're going to ask the person, Hey, here's what I'm struggling with. Here's what I'm working on. Tell me why I suck. And then you get the feedback. If you apply that strategy, and go after the top five to 10 people in your industry, in your niche, who are doing a thing, you can get access to them. And if you intentionally show up with that one question that you want an answer to, and then you end it with, tell me why I suck, you'll get their brutal, honest feedback and get the advice you actually need to grow. When I'm looking at somebody's YouTube channel, for example, I have a lot of thoughts, you know, and when I'm dealing with a high achiever, there is a totally different vibe when you're, when you're working with me and you're just getting started and you're at the beginning of your journey and you're not an achiever yet. It's a lot softer and a lot nicer. It's a lot more rah, rah. You can do it. It's a lot more injecting belief and energy. Like, hey, just get started. Make your first video. It's okay if it sucks. Like, go, go. Create momentum and energy. If you are a high achiever, and I know that, and I know that I can push you a little bit further, it's a lot more blunt, it's a lot more bold, and it's a lot more to the point. It'll be a lot more, I pull up their channel, oh my gosh, okay, this sucks here. This you have to change right now. Like this, this banner is terrible. You got to move this. Your avatar is way too far out. These thumbnails need a total redesign and just breaking them. Boom, 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 boom. Like, okay, good. Give it to me. Give it to me. You can tell that they crave. They're not taking it personally. This is the problem. If you're not a high achiever, then you take it personally because you're so worried about what you're creating that any negative feedback 
you take personally and then the people giving the feedback are too afraid to give you more feedback. That's why they'll give you one out of the three. But if I don't know you, and even if you are at the start, if you led with, tell me why I suck, I would still tell you my honest opinions and give you the feedback that you need. Makes all the difference in the world. So step one is to go seek out the people. Maybe you know them already, or maybe you don't, but you're gonna seek them out. You're gonna join their events. You're gonna get on their Zoom calls. You're gonna follow them on Instagram or wherever they go live. You're gonna you're gonna follow them and, and make it your plan in the next three months to ask one of your five to 10 heroes this question, right? Whatever question you care about most. Two, you're going into the learning, into that event with the intention of, I am going to ask this person this question. You know it. And as soon as they go over to Q&A, or as soon as you see somebody in the hallway, you don't care about anything else that's happened at this event. The only thing that matters is that you get your question asked to this person, laser focused, so that you don't regret it later on, like, ah, oh, yeah, I wasn't the, ah, oh, and then the lineup gets too long and you don't get your question answered, right? It's the only goal. Anything else is a bonus. And then three, as you're asking the question, you pose it and say, tell me your honest feedback. I need it. Tell me why I suck. Do that. You get the honest truth that you need to actually help you accomplish your goals. Also, to make sure you're actually taking action after watching this video, I've designed a special free worksheet just for this video. The worksheet will highlight all of the lessons learned in this video, as well as pull out our three favorite learnings and quotes that will inspire you to actually do something. The worksheet will also give you space to write down what your key takeaways are and your specific plan of action to make sure you're getting results. If you want the worksheet designed specifically for this video, absolutely for free, there's a link in the description below. Go click on it and start building the momentum in your life and your business. I'll see you there. With Tesla, the, the, the goal is to, um, to try to create electric vehicles that are more compelling than gasoline vehicles as a product. Um, I mean, the, the fundamental issue we have in um, in energy and transport is, is, is the tragedy of the commons. You know, we've got the CO2 capacity of the oceans and atmosphere that is unpriced, or mostly unpriced. Um, and so it's, um, it, it's almost like we're, we're sort of dumping garbage in the atmosphere and, and nobody's paying for garbage collection. Um, so it, it's, um, it's the most unfortunate situation because the uh, there, there, are, there are quite significant vested interests in, um, in, in oil, gas, and coal um, with, with enormous amounts of money. Um, it, it, it's quite a difficult battle to fight, and you can't expect them to simply roll over and commit suicide or something. They're, they, they will fight it hard, and they, and they, they have been. Um, and so, unfortunately, it, so it requires fighting hard back and, um, and, and, and creating. Uh, products in the absence of there being attacks on CO2, creating products that don't rely on the relative economics of, of um, using um, uh, hydrocarbon fuels versus, um, say, versus electric uh, cars. And so that, that, that was our goal from, from Tesla from the beginning. Um, and I, I'm really um, I'm excited to, to see that we've um, we achieved that goal actually with, with the Model S, uh, which was, we, we, as was mentioned, the Model S was recently uh, awarded um, top honors by, um, it was award, awarded sort of car of the year and automobile of the year. Um, and, and that was against a very difficult field of, of gasoline cars. Um, and so I'm hopeful that this will be seen as a pivotal moment in transport where, where people where people you know, finally appreciated that an electric car could be better than a gasoline car. The President's first space policy directive to me was go to the moon, and the word in there is sustainably. A fully reusable vehicle uh, will cost a uh, uh, hundred times less per flight than an expendable vehicle. And it, it kind of makes sense. You think of, uh, of any other mode of transport, it could be like uh, you know, um, jet aircraft or uh, uh, cars, bicycles, horses, every other mode of transport, boats, they're all reusable. 
the, the, the only th the, the weird one that isn't reusable is is space. That's right. So um, you can imagine how how expensive it would be if every time you flew in a jet that you had to get a new jet, right. um, as opposed to refuel the jet. It would be insanely expensive to fly a jet if it was single use. There wouldn't be anybody flying. No, exactly. It'd be like it'd be like a few research flights at, uh, at, at extreme expense, and that's that's all the flying that would occur. I actually don't care at all about money at all, <laughs> um, but I do care about us becoming space bearing civilization. Yeah. And I do know that uh, if if we don't uh, achieve full and rapid reusability, it will not happen. Yeah. And so that's why that's the only reason I actually want, want money at all. What I really want to see is, you know. Permanent base on moon on the moon, permanently uh, occupied human base on the moon, and, and us building a city on Mars. It wasn't as though in creating these companies that we thought that we would be successful. Um, I thought that the most likely outcome was failure, um, but but it was still worth doing, even though the, the odds of success were low. In fact, even for for, for SpaceX, the originally what I started doing was not creating a rocket company, but but actually was going to do. Um, a small mission to Mars, which was just a philanthropic mission where you would send a, a small greenhouse with seeds and dehydrated gel, and the, would, um, upon landing, hydrate the gel, and you'd have this cool picture of green plants on a red background. And the public tends to respond to precedence and superlatives. So this would be the first life on Mars, furthest that life's ever traveled, um, and you'd have this great money shot of green plants on a red background. I mean, the way I tend to view problems is, is from, a, from a physics standpoint. I, mean, I, think, I think physics is a good analytical framework um, and uh, one of the key things in, in, in physics is to reason from first principles. Um, this is contrary to the way most human reasoning takes place, which is by analogy. Um, reasoning from first principles just means that you, you figure out what, what are the fundamental what, what are the fundamental truths or or things that are pretty sh people are pretty sure are fundamental truths, and and can you build up to a conclusion from from that uh, or, you know from, from those principles and. Um, uh, and, and then certainly if you come up with some idea and it appears to violate one of those fundamental truths, then you're probably wrong um, or you should get a really big prize or something like that. Um, so uh, this may seem like, I don't know, it may, be, may seem sort of obvious when it's explained, but it's actually not what people do. Um, you, reasoning by analogies is helpful because it's a shortcut. Yeah. Um, and, and, it's, and it's mostly correct, but, but uh, it tends to be most incorrect when you're dealing with new things because it's hard to analogize to something really new. Well, I mean, Tesla really faced a severe uh, thre threat of death uh, due to the Model 3 production ram. Essentially, the, the company was bleeding money like crazy and, and just, if, if we didn't solve these problems in a very short period of time, uh, we would die. Uh, and it was extremely difficult to solve them. How close to death did you come? We are within single digit weeks. 22 hours a day, or like what, how many yeah, hours? I was working, yeah, so seven days a week, sleeping in the factory. Uh, I worked everywhere from the, I worked in the, I worked in the paint shop, general assembly, body shop. You ever worry about yourself imploding? Like it's just yeah, too yeah. much? absolutely. No one should put this many hours into work. This is not good. And people should not work this hard. I'm not. They should not do this. This is too, it's very painful. Was your goal at that point, when you started with Falcon 1, to get to the point where we had nine engines for Falcon 9? Was that your goal at that time? When I started SpaceX, I, I only thought there was maybe a 10% chance of getting Falcon 1 to orbit. I did not at all think that this would happen. Yeah. Uh, so this is for sure a dream come true. Um, uh, but I, I, literally at the time, I didn't know anything about rockets. Uh, and I was, you know, I've been the chief engineer of SpaceX since day one. And I don't really know anything about rockets, which is why the first three rockets failed. Right. Um, and then, so, so the first three Falcon ones for SpaceX yes. were failures. Yes. And then, the, well, tell me about uh, the fourth one. The, the, the fourth one. So I, I actually only had enough money for three three flights. Um, so I had no more money left, but we managed to. to so the, the, the team sort of rallied, and we managed to put together enough spare parts to, create a, to do a fourth launch, and that fourth launch was successful. When you were in college and developing these skills, you wanted to do some things that were of benefit to humanity. Why, yeah. why did you think that? Well, because not um, everyone does. Yeah, no, uh, I, I guess it was, um, I, I had sort of an existential crisis uh, of like, what does it all mean, and what's the meaning, you know, what's the meaning of life, and um, was this 3 a.m. over a beer, or this was well, more uh, serious? Than that? It probably goes back to, to high school, I guess. Uh, um, I don't want to give a laboriously long answer, but uh, 
I was, uh, I, yeah, I, I had sort of a dark childhood. It wasn't good. <laughs> um, probably partially brought on by, by, by reading some of the philosophers. Like, D don't ever read Schopenhauer and Nietzsche if you're 14. It's, <laughs> it's not good. Yeah, or or um, Ayn Rand either, too. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, so um, I was just trying to find, figure out what, you know, what does it all mean. And um, um, actually, uh, when I read The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which I think is a great work of philosophy, um, that, that, that sort of highlighted the point that uh, very often the, the issue is understanding what questions to ask. And if you can properly frame the question, then the answer is the easy part. Um, so I thought uh, things that uh, expand the scope and scale of the human consciousness um, and allow us to better ask questions and, you know, and, and, and achieve greater enlightenment, those are good things. And so that's sort of what, what, what can we do that's going to um, most likely lead to that outcome? There weren't very many people on the internet. Um, and certainly nobody was making any money at all. Uh, most people thought the internet was going to be a fad. A year ago, Musk sold his software company, Zip2, which enabled newspapers to publish online for $400 million cash. Receiving cash is cash. I mean, those are just a large number of Ben Franklin's. So this is an ATM. And what we're going to do is transform the traditional banking industry. I do not fit the picture of a banker. This is Julie. Raising $50 million is a matter of making a series of phone calls. And the money is there. I've sunk the great majority of, of my net worth into X.com, which is the new banking and mutual funds company on the internet that I've started. Big, big X. Exactly. X.com. I think X.com could absolutely be a, a multi-billion dollar bonanza. I mean, what you've got going on with the internet is it's basically like an earthquake where the epicenter is Silicon Valley. And it's, it's shaking up the whole world. Elon, you've, you've been compared to Henry Ford, Richard Branson, um, <laughs> you know, Steve Jobs. Uh, who do you compare yourself to? Um, I, I don't really compare myself to anyone. Um, I mean, it's not, um, I mean, there's certain people that I admire from history that I think are, you know, I think are great. Um, sort of certainly many of the scientists and engineers and literary figures and so forth. Um, and uh, like I'm, I'm a big, big fan of uh, Ben Franklin, you know, who's a scientist and sort of thinker. And yeah, I mean, he was the kind of guy who, who did, did did what needed to be done, you know. So I, like, guys like that, I right wouldn't say I compare myself in any way, but I, I certainly admire them. Well, I think part of the, the problem, the reason people aren't as excited about space is that we haven't been pushing the frontier as much. Um, and so you can only you can only watch the same movie so many times, and it, before it gets a little boring. Um, and, you know, in, in, the, in the 60s and early 70s, we were really pushing the frontier of, of human spaceflight. Um, and, uh, and, and obviously, those land, landing on the moon is regarded as one of the greatest achievements of humanity, of, of arguably of life itself. Um, and, and even though only a handful of people went to the moon, vicariously, we all went there. Well, at least I wasn't alive at the time, so, but retrospectively. Um, <laughs> And, uh, you know, and, and it, was, it was just one of those really inspiring things that I think make, made everyone glad to be, uh, uh, you know, human. You know, it's like the things that we, we're, we don't, we're, they're bad things, human ideas, and they're, they're good things, and, and this is one of the good things. Um, and I, I do think it's important that, that we have these inspiring things that uh, uh, make you glad to get up in the morning and, um, and, that, that, uh, and, and, and glad to be a member of the human race. Uh, and and, and we, need to, we need to push that, that, that frontier. Um, so, um, and, and I think uh, the, the great goal we should be trying to pursue is trying to make life, uh, li make, make life multi-planetary. Mm -hmm. So to, to establish a self-sustaining and, and growing uh, civilization on another planet, uh, Mars being the only realistic possibility. Um, and, uh, and I think that would just be one of the greatest things humanity could ever try to do. Innovation comes from questioning the way things have been done before. Yeah. Um, and if in the education system you're, you're taught not to do that, that will inhibit uh, entrepreneurship. Being able to question what you're being taught. Being able to... Yeah. I yeah. mean, just, uh, you know, saying, well, is there a better way? Yeah. Um, you know, to ask that question. 2008 in particular was, 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 was awful because um, we had the third launch failure in a row of, of our Falcon 1 vehicle at SpaceX. Um, and... Um, we, uh, the Tesla financing round that we were raising fell apart. Um, 
because the economy is going to tailspin. Um, and it's pretty hard to raise money for a startup car company, uh, you know, late 2008 when GM and Chrysler are busy going bankrupt. Mm -hmm. um, that, that, was, that was tough. And then Solar City had to deal with uh, Morgan Stanley, and Morgan Stanley had to renege on the deal because they themselves were running out of money. Um, so it looked like all three companies were going to die. Mm -hmm. And I was also going through a divorce. So that was definitely a low point. So it's 2008, <laughs> you're going through a divorce, which like some, to borrow your word, douchebag bloggers are writing about to make even worse. Right, uh, yes, that's true. Um, in addition to, <sighs> to all that stuff happening, I was getting dumped on massively in the press. Right. Yeah. You're, you know, it looks like all three companies <laughs> yeah. are going to fail. I mean, why do you keep going with all three? Like, I feel like even a lot of great entrepreneurs right. in that situation would have been like, I I've already sunk everything I have in these companies, and I got to pick one. But you didn't. I mean, you kept doing all three. Why? Um, yeah, that was, a, that was a very tough call. Um, at, at the end of 2008, that was, that was probably the tough, you know, one of the toughest calls I've had to make. Um, because I could either um, reserve capital for one company or the other. I mean, fortunately, Solar City didn't need a ton of capital, so they were, they were okay. Um, but between SpaceX and, and, and Tesla, um, you know, it's sort of like, like if you've got two kids, and mm -hmm. what do you do? Do you spend all your money to, to, to maximize the probability of success of, of one, or do you? You try to keep both alive. Fortunately, mm -hmm. it worked. It's very important to, to seek out, uh, to actively seek out um, and listen very carefully to negative feedback. Um, and this is something that people tend to avoid because mm -hmm. it's, it's painful. painful yeah. um, but but the, I think this is a very common mistake, is to, to not actively seek out and listen to uh, negative feedback. Where do you do that? Do you go into forums? Um, do you go into Twitter? Like, what, what are your uh, areas where you go to look for feedback on, let's say, the Tesla? Well, it's like every, everyone I talk to is, um, in fact, when, um, when friends get a product, I say, look, I d don't tell me what you like, tell me what you don't like. Right. Um, and, and because otherwise your friend is not going to tell you what he doesn't like. Right. This guy's going to say, oh, I love this and that, and, and, and then and leave out the, this is the stuff I don't like list. Mm -hmm. Because he wants to be your friend, want, you know, it doesn't want to offend you. So, um, so you really need to, 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 to sort of coax negative feedback. Um, and, you should, and you know that if somebody is your, is your friend or at least not your enemy and they're giving you negative feedback, um, then they may be wrong, but it's coming from a good place. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes even your enemies give you good negative feedback. When I started the first uh, internet company, Zip2, um, uh, with my brother and, a, and a, another person, um, yeah, Greg Curry, the, uh, it wasn't really with the thought of being wealthy. It, it, you know, I've got nothing against being wealthy, but... <laughs> um, the, <laughs> we'll get back to that later, too. <laughs> but but it's just, it, it was just from the standpoint of wanting to be part of the, the internet. And uh, I, I figured if we could make enough money to just get by, it would be, that would be okay. Um, and when we, when we started off... Uh, We'd, we'd, we literally only had like one computer, and so it would be our web server during the day, and I'd code at night. Um, and we we just got a a, a small office um, uh, in, in Palo Alto back when rent was not insane, um, and uh, it, it cost us like four hundred fifty dollars a month. It was cheaper than an apartment, so we actually just slept in the office, and then sh and then shower at the YMCA at on Page Mill Al Camino. So we'd walk over there and and, and shower and. Uh, and that was um, actually, I think uh, that was when I f we first I first met you, by the way. Um, and uh, so I don't know if how many people, no, probably not many people know this, but uh, uh, we actually pitched uh, Steve in like January '96 on uh, the, the Zip2 business plan. Uh, and actually, I thought um, Steve was actually one of the most up to speed on. On, on what actually was in our business plan. Most, most of the people we met did not actually read our business plan. Um, in fact, a lot of people, we, a lot of venture capitalists we met at the time didn't even know what the internet was. Or, or they've never used, they'd never used I'm it. Sure, they didn't think I'm not sure if we still do. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, I'm talking like, you know, sort of well-known people on Sand Hill. It was like, wow, okay. Um, but, but at the time, nobody had made any, any money on the internet, so I guess uh, that's... Um, you know, it, then it wasn't really clear evidence that, that there was, was a business. I mean, I should say that, you know, when I was a kid, I, I didn't really have any grand designs. I mean, the, the reason I started com programming computers is because I like computer games. Um, and I play lots of computer games, and um, 
I learned that if I wrote software and sold it, then I could get more money and buy better computers. So it wasn't really, you know, with some grand vision or anything. Um, when I was growing up, I'd, I'd read lots of books, and uh, they were very often set in the United States, and it seemed like a lot of new technology was being developed in the United States. So I, I thought, okay, I really want to work on new technology, so I want to get to Silicon Valley. Um, you know, which at, uh, when I was growing up, at Silicon Valley seemed like some sort of mythical place, uh, you know, like Mount Olympus or something. Well, I think I think one thing that's important is uh, if if you have a choice of a lower valuation uh, with, with someone you really like, or a higher valuation with someone you have a question mark about, take the lower valuation. Um, it's, it's better to have a, a higher quality uh, venture capitalist who you think is would be great to work with. Than to um, you know get a get a higher valuation with someone where there's even a question mark really you know I think that's that's important it's sort of like getting married you know the secret to your success to be the CEO of two companies at the same time no oh. <laughs> I think it's because uh, look at the correlation yeah struggling companies everything's in the craft can in December 2008 so let's take on a new CEO gig and, yeah and same for Steve coming back to Apple uh, no it definitely it was not my intention to be CEO of two companies. Um, the, uh, I mean, I, after, I mean, the, the, I, I, there are certain things that I, I kind of wanted to, ha I thought were important to happen, and I thought it was important that, um, that, that there was, that, that, that an electric vehicle happened, that there was a, a success in the electric vehicle arena, uh, because the, the, the incumbent companies were convinced that it was not possible to create a, an electric car that looked good, had range, a good range performance and so forth. Um, and that even if you did make such a car, it would not sell, yeah, because people had this love of gasoline. Um, and uh, so we had to show that it was possible to create a compelling electric car, long range, good looking, you know, all, all those things. That, that was a Tesla Roadster. And if you created, if, if, if you made such a thing, people would buy it. I certainly was uh, quite, um, I was very, very bookish. I was reading all the time. So I was either reading, uh, working on my computer, reading comics, playing Dungeons and Dragons, uh, that kind of thing. And, um, um, I understand Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, that wonderful book by Douglas Adams. That was, yeah. a, that was a key book for you. What, what was it about that book that, that fired your imagination? Um, yeah, so uh, I guess when I was in the, around 12 or 13, I had kind of an existential crisis, and I was reading various books um, on trying to figure out the meaning of life and well, like what does it all mean? Because uh, it, it, it sort of seemed quite meaningless, and then um, uh, my, we happened to have like some, some books by Nietzsche and Schopenhauer in the house, which you should not read at age 14. <laughs> <laughs> it's bad. <laughs> it's really negative. Um, <laughs> so, so, uh, but but then I then I read uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which was like quite positive, I think, and um, uh, and it sort of highlighted the the. the an important point, which is that a lot of times the question is harder than the answer. And if you can properly phrase the question, then the answer is the easy part. Nice. Um, and so, uh, the, if, to the degree that we can um, better uh, understand the universe, then we know, better know what questions to ask. And um, then whatever the question is that most approx approximates what's the meaning of life, <laughs> you know, that, that, that's, that's the question we could ultimately get closer to understanding. Um, and so I thought, well, to the degree that we can expand the scope and scale of consciousness and, you know, and knowledge, um, human knowledge, then that would be a good thing. Well, we've got a lot of work to do uh, because we've got um, a lot of service centers and charge stations to construct. Um, so mostly it's like we're trying to build our service and charge infrastructure as fast as possible. Um, and uh, I know this, like s some of the customers who have ordered a car, they're not in the major cities, so they're a little unhappy with us because we are delaying delivery of their car. Um, and uh, in fact, I'm going to apologize to some of them personally to exp and explain the reason we are delaying delivery is because it's, we really want them to have a good experience. But if they're too far from a service center and and the charging is not sorted out, then they will not have a good experience. Um, so. We're going to delay the cause just for a few months to make sure that they have a good experience.
I think it's also important to reason from first principles rather than by analogy. So the normal way that we conduct our lives is we, 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 we reason by analogy. Um, it's, we're doing this because it's like something else that was done, mm -hmm. or it's like what um, other people are doing. Me too but, type ideas. Yeah, it's slight, well, it's, it's, yeah, it's slight iterations take, yeah. on, on, on a theme. Mm -hmm. um, and and, uh, and, and it's, it, cause it's, it's, it's kind of mentally easier to reason by analogy rather than from first principles. But by first principles is kind of a physics way of looking at the world. And what that really means is you kind of boil things down to the most fundamental truths and, and say, okay, what are we sure is true or, or as sure as possible is true? And then reason up from there. Mm -hmm. uh, that takes a lot more mental energy. Um, Give me but, an example of that. Like, what's one thing that you've, you've done that on that you feel has worked for you? Sure. So, um, somebody could say, um, in fact, people do, uh, that battery packs are really expensive and that's just the way they'll always be because that's the way they've been in the past. When trying different things, you, you, you've got to have some acceptance of failure, uh, as you were alluding to earlier. Failure must be an option. If failure is not an option, it's going to result in extremely conservative choices, and you, you, may not, you may get something even worse than lack of innovation. Things may go backwards. Um, so, um, if what you really want is uh, risk, risk to, 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 you, want, you want reward and punishment to be, to be proportionate to the actions that you seek. So, if uh, if, if what you're seeking is innovation, then you should reward success and innovation, um, and only there should be minor consequences for lack of minor consequences for for trying and failing. There should be minor, um, with significant rewards for trying and succeeding, minor consequences for trying and not succeeding, um, and big. And, and, and major negative consequences for not trying. Or maybe I just blank out the word doubt. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so, uh, no, I mean, I, to be totally frank, I doubted us too. So I, I thought we, uh, you know, had maybe, when starting SpaceX, maybe had a 10% chance of reaching orbit. So, so you know, to those who, who doubted us, I was like, well, I think you're probably right, you know. Um, I mean, the number of times uh, that I, I was told, like, because uh, I was taking the money that I earned from, from PayPal and, and rolling it into to create SpaceX and Tesla, and, and, and I was, ended up spending it all. But it wasn't the intention, but, um, and, and, and uh, almost both companies went bankrupt, frankly. 2008 was a tough year. Um, you know, it took us, took us uh, four attempts just to get to orbit with Falcon 1. Um, and uh, so, but a lot of times I was, you know, I, I, people would tell me this joke, like, how do you make a small fortune in the rocket industry? You start with a large one is the punchline. <laughs> and I was like, okay, I already heard that joke 12,000 times, you know? <laughs> so so um, anyway, um, and it, was, it, it almost came true. Um, you know, we, we just barely made it there, that fourth launch of Falcon 1. That's all the money we had for that fourth launch. And then, uh, it, and that wasn't even enough to, to save the company. We also then had to win the NASA cargo resupply contract. Um, so that, that came a little after, you know, a little, little bit later, or right towards the end of 2008. Um, those are the two key, key things that, that saved SpaceX. Otherwise, we would have, we would have, you know, not made it. So, um, so yeah, I think those those doubters were, their probability assessment was correct. Um, but fortunately. Uh, Beta smiled upon us and brought us to this day. My question for you is, as you look back on your career in the space industry, what has been the most surprising or unexpected challenge that you faced? And along those lines, if you were to go back in time and talk to your 20-year-old self, would you do anything differently? Go back in time to your 20-year-old self. I mean, I think, I'd, if I, could, I think it would make far fewer mistakes, obviously, if I could go, like, here's a list of all the Things you're about to do, please do not do them. <laughs> Wouldn't we yeah, all? It'd be a very long list, and like you know, here, let me I, you know, write it down or something. You know, um, I mean, it's hindsight's twenty twenty, so it's hard to say. Um, 
I mean, number of, I've made so many foolish mistakes, I have a lot count, honestly. Um, I mean, some of these things I just wish I, like, the, the, like that's simple sort of mantra, management by rhyming. I mean, it, it worked for Homer, okay? Um, but management by rhyming is, the, that thing I was saying, like, if the, if the schedule's long, the design is wrong. We've overcomplicated the design many times. Um, and I think we should have just gone with a, a simpler design. Um, with the acid test being, how long will it take to f for this to fly? And if it's going to take a long time, don't do it. Do something else. But one of the fun things for me is watching the, the, the cargo go into the crew vessel. You know, all of a sudden we had Dragon 1, now we have Crew Dragon, and it's, it's substantially different but, but familiar. Mm -hmm. So tell us, like, what's been some of the hardest parts to transition from cargo into crew, because crew is a little more important than, <laughs> than cargo. Yes, I mean, cargo can be replaced, crew cannot. Um, right. And so the, the level of scrutiny, the level of attention is, I mean, I don't know, order of magnitude greater. I mean, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was already high for cargo, I mean, we're, and, and, uh, but it's, it's just a whole other level for, for crew. Um, so, you know, and I told the SpaceX team that you know the uh, this mission reliability is not merely the top priority; it is the only priority right now. Mm -hmm. um, so we're just doing continuous uh, engineering reviews uh, from now, nonstop, uh, 24 hours a day until launch. Just yeah. going over everything again and again wow. and again. And I was out at the pad just recently, just walking down the rocket. Um, we, we've you know we've got a team that's just crawling over the rocket in the horizontal. Then we're going to rotate it vertical. Then we're going to crawl all over in the vertical. And um, we're just looking for any, any possible action that can improve the probability of success, no matter how small, whether that comes from an intern or me or anyone. It doesn't right. matter. Zip2 started off um, as basically, uh, like I said, we're trying to figure out how to, how to make enough money to exist as a company. And the, so, so since there wasn't really any advertising money being made, uh, we thought we could um, help existing companies get online, bring their stuff online. So we, we developed software that helped bring um, a lot of the newspapers and media companies online because a lot of them just didn't, they also didn't know what the internet was. You had or, some big customers, didn't you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and, and even the ones that were aware of the internet didn't have a software team, so they, could, they weren't very good at developing functionality. Um, and uh, so we had, as um, investors and customers, uh, the New York Times company, Knight Ritter, Hearst, mm -hmm. and, and so we were able to get them to pay us to develop software for them to bring them online, so online publishing stuff. And we did maps and directions and yellow pages and white pages and uh, various other things. I, th I think we, we need to push for radical breakthroughs. Um, and if you don't push for radical breakthroughs, you're not going to get radical out outcomes. Um, and that, that does mean taking risks. Um, and, and yeah, common sense that the, the, if you take a big risk, in order to have, have a big reward, there must be a big risk. It's, most of the time, you cannot find big reward for small risk. That's, those are rare. Um, so you're going to have some proportionality of the risk and reward. So, so really just is it, is it, simplify your product as much as possible. Um, You know, and then like, if I think of some of the ways in which, how does a smart engineer make dumb mistakes, including, you know, is optimize something that shouldn't exist. Mm -hmm. Don't optimize something that shouldn't exist. Um, but people are trained to do this in college. You can't say no to the professor. You know, the professor's gonna give you the, the exam and you've gotta answer all the questions or they will get angry. Um, so, and give you a bad grade. So then you, you always optimize, the, you always answer the question. A lot of the times you should say this is the wrong question. Mm -hmm. Right. In fact, the question is definitely wrong to some degree, just how wrong. Um, and I think just generally taking the approach that your design is some degree wrong, probably a lot more than you think, your goal is to make it less wrong over time.
What sort of things do you look for in people or in processes that make the workforce better? Sure. Well, I think the massive thing that can be done is to make sure your incentive structure is such that uh, innovation is rewarded and lack of innovation is punished. So you've got to be a carrot and a stick. So uh, if somebody is innovating um, and doing, ma making good, good progress, then they should be promoted sooner. Um, and if somebody is completely failing to innovate, um, not, not every role requires innovation, but uh, if they're in a role where innovation is, should be happening and it's not happening, then they should either not be promoted or exited. And let me tell you, you'll get, promote, you'll get, you'll, you'll, you'll get innovation real fast. So now your actual total mass of a steel, uh, of a reusable steel spacecraft is less than that of the most advanced carbon fiber vehicle you could possibly imagine. Yeah, wow. But this is, happened by accident, by the way. This may sound like some great insight, but it actually happened because we were moving too slowly on composite. Um, and I was like, we cannot move this slowly or we'll go bankrupt. So right. just get, do this with steel. So you ha I mean, the design has to be focused on problem solving. Otherwise, you're going to spend too much time trying to figure it you, you don't start with a, yeah. Yeah, I'm like uh, sort of taking to management, management by rhyming. If the schedule is, schedule is long, your design is wrong. Who now works at Scientific American as a writer, and, uh, and, and she, she related the anecdote that uh, we went on a date. I was, all I was talking about was electric cars. Um, <laughs> that was not a, big, a winning conversation. <laughs> so it was a bit of a monologue, was it? Yeah, she said, uh, she, she said the first question I asked her was, do you ever think about electric cars? <laughs> No, she so never does. So, so you learn from that. That wasn't the best yeah, shout-out was, line. Wasn't wasn't great. The real way I think you you actually achieve intellectual property protection is by innovating fast enough. If your rate of innovation is high, then you don't need to worry about protecting the IP um, because other companies will be copying something that you did years ago, mm -hmm. um, and that's fine. You know, um, just make sure you. Your rate of innovation is fast. Um, speed is really speed of innovation is, is what is what matters. Um, and I do I do say this to my teams like uh, uh, quite a lot that innovation per unit time as I go innovation per year if you want, want to say it, like is is what matters not innovation absent time because if you wanted to make say 100% um, improvement in something and that took 100 years or one year that's radically different. So um, it's like, what, what is your rate of innovation that, that, that matters? And is the rate of innovation, um, is that accelerating or decelerating? Um, and a, a weird thing happens when companies get big is that most companies um, or organizations, the bigger they get, they tend to get less innovative. Um, not just less innovative on a per person basis, but less innovative in the absolute. Um, and I think this is probably because the incentive structure is not, uh, is not there for innovation. Um, it, it, it's not enough to use words to encourage innovation. The incentive structure must be aligned with that. That's fundamental. You need to work, if you, if, depending on how well you want to do, and particularly if you're starting a company, you need to work super hard. So what, what does super hard mean? Um, well, when my brother and I were starting our first company, uh, in, instead of getting an apartment, we just rented a, sm a small office and we slept on the couch. Uh, and we, we showered at the, the YMCA. And uh, we're, we're so hot up, we had just one computer. So the, 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 the website was up during the day uh, and I was coding at night. Seven days a week, all the time. Um, and I, I uh, sort of briefly had a girlfriend in that period and in order to, be with me, she has to sleep in the office. So, uh, w work hard, like, it, it, I mean, every waking hour, that's, that's the, the thing I would, I would say, if, if you, particularly if you're starting a company. Um, and, I mean, if you do simple math, say like, okay, if somebody else is working 50 hours and you're working 100, uh, you'll get twice as, done, as much done in the course of a year as the, as, uh, the other company. You don't need college to learn, it, learn stuff, okay? Everything is available basically for free. Uh, you can learn anything you want for free. 
It is not a question of learning. Um, there, there is a value that colleges have, which is like, you know, seeing whether somebody's, is, can somebody work hard at something, including a bunch of sort of annoying homework assignments, and still do their homework assignments, uh, and, and kind of soldier through and, and, and get it done. You know, that's, that's like the, the main value of college. And then also, you, you know, if you, you, if you probably want to hang around with a bunch of people your own age for a while instead of going right into the workforce. Um, so I think colleges are basically for fun and to prove you can do your chores, but they're not for learning. I came to the conclusion that um, my initial premise was, was wrong, uh, that in fact, the, um, th there's, there's a great deal of will. Uh, you know, th th there, there's, there's not such a shortage. Um, but people don't think there's a way. Um, and, and that if people thought there was, there was a way, or at least something that wouldn't you know, break the federal budget, um, then, th then people would, would support it. Um, which in retrospect, I think is actually kind of obvious because um, the, the United States is a distillation of the human spirit of e exploration. Mm -hmm. uh, people came here from other places. Um, I mean, it's, you know, th there's no nation, there's no, I mean, there's no nation that, that's more a nation of explorers than the United, the United States, but, but people need to believe that it's possible and it's, that it's not, you know, it's, they don't have you know, to give up like healthcare or something important. <laughs> right. you know, it's just, it's gotta be, that, 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 that's important. So, so I thought, okay, well, then it's not a question of will, it's, it's a question of showing that there's a way. In the beginning, nobody wanted a Tesla, I can tell you that. Uh, <laughs> the, 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 when we made the original sort of roadster sports car, uh, people were like, well, why would I want an electric car? That's, my gasoline car works fine. Uh, I'm like, no, electric car is better, I should try it. Um, <laughs> and it was hard, you know, hard to get people to do a test drive. First of all, nobody knew who we were. They never heard of this company. And I'm like, yeah, we're named after Nikola Tesla. You know that guy? Nope. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so for sure we were doing push in the beginning because people said there was no one telling us that they wanted an electric car. So it was not, it was not out of like, you know, it was like lots of people coming up to me saying, hey, I really want an electric car. I, did, I heard that zero times. Um, <laughs> So people we like, it's like, man, we're gonna make an electric car and show that these things can be good, um, and then people will want them. Um, you know, it's like, I think it was like Henry Ford said, that, like the, you know, if you, when we talk about the Model T, it's like if you ask the public what they wanted, they'd say a, fa a faster horse. Mm -hmm. So if, if, you, if you did like a big survey and said, hey, what, hey, public, before automobiles, what would you like? It's like, well, I'd like my horse to go three miles an hour faster and eat less food and, uh, you know, be stronger and live longer and that kind of thing. Um, th there'll be basically a, a bunch of incremental improvements on horse. Because um, people, when you say like, well, what about an automobile, that car that drives itself, I'm like, what are you talking about? That's, that, sounds, that sounds crazy. Um, but when you actually make an, an automobile and give it to people and say, okay, now this is a horse where you can keep it in the barn and if you leave for a month, it's still alive. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so carry more more weight than a horse and go further and that kind of thing. So, anyway, the it's like when when it's a radically new product, people don't know that they want it because it's just not in their in their, in their scope. I think when they first started making TVs, they did a nationwide survey. I think this might have been like. 46 or 48, it's like a famous nationwide survey, will you ever buy a TV? And I was like 96% of respondents said no. Hmm. Some, some crazy number. Like basically everyone's like, would you buy a TV? And maybe they put a price in there or something, I don't know. But it was famously, almost everyone said they would not buy a TV, but they didn't know what they're talking about. So, so the big game changing stuff at the beginning is a company push kind of a thing most of the time. But yeah. then changes to the product over time can be a lot more customer pull kind of a focus. Yeah, ch changes to the product over time can be, uh, incremental changes, um, then, then, then customers can certainly tell you, it's good to get customer feedback to say, how can we improve the product? Um, 
And once they're using it, they can say, okay, I like this thing about it, I don't like this other thing, and then we can improve the product over time. Customer yeah. feedback after they, they have the fundamental thing is, is great. I think failure is bad. Um, I don't think it's good. Um, mm -hmm. But if, if, if something's important enough, then you, you do it even though the risk of failure is high. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I think my advice if somebody is in, wants to start a company is they should bear in mind that the most likely outcome is, is that it's not going to work. And they should reconcile themselves to that pos strong possibility. Um, and they should only do it if they feel that they, they're, they are really compelled to do it. You know? right. um, because it's, it's, it's gonna, the, the way starting a company works is like, usually in the beginning, it's the very beginning, it's kind of fun. Um, and then it's really hellish for, for a number of years. You talked about chewing glass. Yeah, there's, there's a, fr a friend of mine who's a successful entrepreneur um, and uh, started actually his career around the same time as I did. And he, he has a good, good, good phrase, his name's Bo Lee. Uh, um, he said, yeah, you know, starting a company is like eating glass and staring into the abyss. Um, and, and you agree with that? Generally true, mm -hmm. um, yeah. And, 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 and if you don't eat the glass, you're not going to be successful. Well, we have a lot of good, good people at SpaceX that, you know, um, a lot of really talented people. Uh, in fact, I wonder like, sometimes how we can make use of their talents in the best way, because you know, I think we're often not using their talents in the best way. Um, Yeah, but you know, to the point of the question that was just asked, I want to make sure Tesla recruiting does not have anything that says requires university because that's absurd. Uh, but there is a requirement of evidence of exceptional ability. Like you just can't, if you're trying to do something exceptional, they must have evidence of exceptional ability. I don't consider going to college evidence of exceptional ability. In fact, ideally, you dropped out and did something. I mean, obviously, you know, we look at like, you know, Gates is a pretty smart guy, he dropped out. Uh, Jobs is pretty smart, he dropped out. You know, Larry Ellison, smart guy, he dropped out. I'm like, obviously not needed. So, did Shakespeare even go to college? Uh, probably not. I, mean, I think of the, these things as just, there's a certain amount of time, and within that time, you want the, the, the best net outcome. So for you know, all the set of actions that you can do, there's going to be uh, some of which will fail, some of which will succeed, and you want the, 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 the net useful output of your set of actions to be the highest. Um, so um, I'm going to have to like, use like a, a baseball analogy. Like, you know, baseball, they don't let you just sit there and wait for the per perfect pitch mm -hmm. until you get a real easy one. They didn't give you three shots. And the third one, they say, okay, and they get off the, and they go back to the, put somebody else up there. Um, so you, you three strikes on, on the baseball, um, not, you know, not on the bat anymore. So, so what, you're, what you're really looking for is like, what's the batting average? You know how, how you doing on uh, on score, um, and and just there's going to be some amount of failure, um, but you you want your net output, um, net useful output to be maximized. Failure is essentially irrelevant unless it is catastrophic. Don't just follow the trend. So um, you may have heard me say it to, to, that it's good to think in terms of. The, the physics approach of first principles, uh, which is rather than reasoning by analogy, you boil things down to the most fundamental truths you can imagine and you reason up from there. And this is a good way to figure out if, if, if something really makes sense or if it's just what everybody else is doing. Um, it, it, it's hard to think that way. You can't think, think that way about everything. It takes a lot of effort. Uh, but if you're trying to do something new, it's the best way to think. Um, and that framework was developed by, by physicists to figure out counterintuitive things. Um, 
like quantum mechanics. So it's really a powerful, powerful method. I believe in the scientific method, and one should be, one should have a healthy skepticism of things in general. And you know, as if, if you first things from a scientific standpoint, you always look at things probabilistically, not definitively. And so I think a lot, a lot of times, if, if somebody's a skeptic in the science community, what they're really saying is that they're not sure that it's 100% certain that, right. that this is the case. But that's, that's, that's not the point. The point is um, that is, 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 is to look at it from the other side. So what, what do you think the percentage chance is of, of this being catastrophic for some meaningful percentage of the Earth's population? Um, is it greater than 1%? Is it even 1%? Um, if it is even 1%, why are we running this experiment? If you want another amazing Elon Musk and Espresso, check it out right there next to me. I think you'll love it. Continue to believe, and I'll see you there. You want to embark on something, it's desirable yeah. to figure out if success is, is at least one of the possibilities. Right, exactly. <laughs>